Hey y'all, Chuck and Mike Wood again. Uh, we're going to continue our discussion through Romans. Today we're on Romans 11, which is uh, going to reveal just how stupid we are. So, <laughs> uh, but that's a good thing. Uh, but before we get into Romans 11, Chuck asked me a question last week, my first uh, experience reading the Bible. So I'm going to turn that one back on him and ask him how he got started reading the Bible. Yeah, I think I was about 12 years old in Germany. And uh, we used to roam main post of Würzburg Cern. And part of the our roaming was the chapel was open. And I can remember going into the chapel and seeing all these books. And so I was like, I stole one. <laughs> <laughs> and I was reading it and it turned out to be a New Testament. I still have it today, my stolen New Testament, which <laughs> We're out there for free, you know, to anybody yeah. to take. But uh, I didn't read it in earnest, but I kind of kept it as a good luck charm. And uh, I would read it in earnest about eight to nine years later. And that was my first experience. I stole a Bible. <laughs> I remember when uh, when I went to Kuwait, I had a bunch of Gideon Bibles and I had them out there on the table and the third country nationals would come by and they were taking them. And that was fine with me. You know, you can have all the Bibles you want, but my, my XO comes out and catches them. Hey, quit taking <laughs> Sir, take it easy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. So what are we doing? Romans 11, this is the last chapter of Paul's uh, discourse on uh, Jew-Gentile relations. And okay. uh, so I'm going to read 1 through 10. He says, I say, brethren, God has not rejected his people, has he? May it never be. For I too am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Or do you not know that the scripture says in the passage about Elijah that he pleads with God against Israel? Lord, they have killed your prophets and they have torn down your altars and I alone am left and they are seeking my life. But what is the divine response to him? I have kept for myself 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal. In the same way, there has also come to be at the present time a remnant according to God's gracious choice. But if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. What then? What Israel is seeking, it is, has not obtained. But those who were chosen obtained it, and the rest were hardened. Just as it is written, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes to see not and ears to hear not, down to this very day. And David says, let their table become a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and a retribution to them. Let their eyes be darkened to see not and bend their backs forever. Okay. So uh, it would seem that the Lord would be awfully angry at Israel since they're the ones who betrayed uh, uh, Jesus. And indeed the church throughout history has called them Christ killers and had some real anti-Semites, but has God given up on Israel? Yeah, now <laughs> I feel a little bit of trepidation about answering this question because um, uh, this has actually been an argument between a whole bunch of good theologians. So, uh, so that's my disclaimer. You know, you talked about in the beginning, we're going to show our ignorance. <laughs> but in a lot of ways, this is a good opportunity to talk about good Bible study methods. And the queen of Bible study is context. Mm. So um, 
you know, uh, we're going to talk a lot about this, but what does Paul say in the very beginning, you know, uh, has God rejected his people? The Greek word for may it never be is meganoito, you mm -hmm. know. And so it's a very strong word that God has not rejected Israel, the Jews. And so, uh, yeah. So, but what, what promises does God need to fulfill for Israel? Yeah, I, I think that's the crux of this argument over whether or not God has given up on Israel, is that God made some promises in the Old Testament that are not yet fulfilled and so either god is breaking his promises or he's still going to fulfill them at some point for instance he told abraham everywhere that your foot treads will be yours forever right mm -hmm. uh, that's forever uh, and then he told uh, david that that uh, his offspring would reign on the throne of israel forever you know so there are land promises there are seed promises that that god has got to fulfill uh in in the people of israel uh because he he promised he would and they were eternal unilateral promises so mm -hmm. that's pro that's two of many i'm sure yeah so what is israel's destiny according to those promises yeah well i think if you read even in the New Testament about the end times, they seem very Jewish. Uh, they, uh, boy, it just, just left my mind. Remember when Jesus said to the disciples uh, that you will sit on 12 thrones ruling the 12 tribes of Israel, right? And, mm -hmm. and part of the New Jerusalem is the names of the patriarchs written i think the patriarchs on the foundation stones they may be on the gates but the apostles are on the other one uh so it's uh, it's you see at the end there the culmination the coming together of israel and the church uh but you definitely it's not that the church is replaced or usurped israel we are combined in the end all right yeah, that's uh something that I think our seminary preached with great gusto, do not mix the church and Israel. It is a big mistake to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Two yeah. separate entities. All right, let's go to verse 11 through 24. All right. I say then, they did not stumble so as to fall, did they? May it never be. But by their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make them jealous. Now, if their transgression is riches for the world and their future is riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their fulfillment be? Or their failure is riches to the Gentiles. How much more will their fulfillment be? But I am speaking to you who are Gentiles in as much then as I am the apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry. If somehow I might move to jealousy my fellow countrymen and save some of them. Uh, for if their rejection is the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from death? If the first piece of dough is holy, the lump is also, and the root is holy, and the branches are too. But if some branches are broken off and you being a wild olive were grafted in among those who became partakers of them of the root of the olive of the rich root of the olive tree do not be arrogant toward the branches but if you are arrogant remember that it is not you who supports the root but the root supports you you will say then branches were broken off that i might be grafted in quite right they were broken off for their unbelief but you stand by your faith do not be conceited but fear for if god is not did not spare the natural branches he will not spare you either <laughs> behold the kindness and severity of god to those who fell severity but to you god's kindness if you continue in his kindness otherwise you also will be cut off and they also, if they do not continue in unbelief, will be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in. For if you were cut off from what is 
by nature a wild olive tree and were grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated tree, how much more will these who are the natural branches be grafted into the olive tree? All right, so uh, what is God doing here with the Gentiles with reference to Israel? Yeah, uh, he says it twice that uh, God is making Israel jealous. And Paul is all for it because he loves his countrymen. You know, he, you know whatever it takes to get them to turn to repent and and see Jesus as the Messiah, he's he's locked arms with God on this thing. You know, hmm. so. that's uh, that's just like God too to send salvation to the Gentiles through the Jews. Jesus hmm. said, "For salvation is of the Jews." Yeah. And then to bring the Jews along through the Gentiles. <laughs> it's like the perfect plan, right? Yeah. So what will result from Israel's salvation? Uh, the, what Paul says is that their acceptance will be life from the dead. You know, that, I'm not mm -hmm. sure quite what that entails, but I think it means that uh, when Israel comes around, it will it will probably be in the midst of great revival and it will be convincing to many people uh, about who Jesus is and, and bring many people back to life. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, so that being the case, you know, that God is working in both of these entities for the other. Uh, what is, what should the Gentiles attitude towards Israel be? <laughs> humility <laughs> uh, Paul goes to great lengths you know hey you're a wild olive branch and you've been grafted grafted in don't think for a minute that you're all that and a bag of chips you know, with the bomb diggity you yeah. know it's all by grace so we we need to stay humble towards our position in Christ as Gentiles and our uh, view of the Jews. So, yeah. yeah. I, I'm preaching through Acts right now and this, this uh, relationship or the tension in this relationship is a lot more obvious early in the church. Mm. Uh, you know, Paul was the apostle of the Gentiles and the, the, apostles in jerusalem seem to appreciate that but then they were also bragging about look how many jews have come to uh, believe and and they're zealous for the law you know so you mm -hmm. feel that tension there uh yeah. where they hadn't they hadn't lost their jewishness right but mm -hmm. they weren't requiring the gentiles to become jews either so uh yeah. probably had a lot more meaning to the romans who were living among jewish believers than it does to us, you know, I haven't even known that many Jewish people in my life. So, yeah. So um, what's the, uh, go ahead. Uh, I'm trying to figure what, out where we what are. What is the risk yeah. that we run um, with our pride? Yeah, I know personally what the risk is because early in my Christian life, when I had a few verses memorized and had read the Bible once or twice. I thought I was something else, you know, and uh, the Lord, through some painful experiences, you know, showed me, hey, it ain't about what you know. It's about what you love, you know, how much you love. It's not about uh, how many Bible verses you can recite. It's about a changed life, right? Mm -hmm. And I think, boy, it's so easy to fall into that trap. Uh, in essence, becoming a modern day Pharisee, you know, so what mm. Paul is saying is, hey, don't make the same mistakes we did, right? Don't become proud. It's all by grace. Yeah. Uh, that verse in first or second Peter, humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God. <laughs> yeah. So if you don't do it, God will, you know. Yeah. And that's a scary place to be. All right, let's go to verse 25. All right, for I do not want you, brethren, to be uninformed of this mystery, 
so that you will not be wise in your own estimation that a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved, just as it is written, the deliverer will come out of Zion. He will remove ungodliness from Jacob. This is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. From the standpoint of the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. But from the standpoint of God's choice, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. For just as you once were disobedient to God, but now have been shown mercy because of their disobedience, so these also now have been disobedient that because of the mercy shown to you, they also may now be shown mercy. For God has shut up all in disobedience so that he may have mercy to all. Okay, so a blindness in part, he says, has happened to Israel. What What is he saying there? I think um, <laughs> I, I remember Jesus talking to the disciples and it said, and this was, and they did not understand for this was kept from them. Mm. And so in the economy of God and his sovereignty, he's piecemealing information to us so that all things work together for good according to his plan, you know, what he's doing. And um, some of that happens because God wants to do that. But some of it happens because we got our eyes closed, our ears plugged, and our heart is dull. Yeah. And I think that's what has happened to Israel, uh, to the Jewish people that rejected the Messiah. And Jesus flat out tells them, you're blind, you, you don't hear, and your heart is dull. And Isaiah said it was going to happen. Mm, so. Yeah. Yeah, and all in the plan of God. I think anybody who has experienced an encounter with Jesus and suddenly come to the knowledge of the truth and had their perspective completely changed mm. understands that I was blind and now I see. They, they understand what this is about. Uh, and it's a miraculous, supernatural change of perspective that happens. And, and I think the Lord is able to turn that around for Israel eventually, right? Yeah, I, I made it a habit of praying for my lost friends that God would open their eyes, ears, and hearts. And as I was praying that over a matter of months, I was like, I better include myself in that <laughs> prayer, you know? So yeah. what is the fullness of the Gentiles? Well, I think that uh, we can see through history, God focusing on one people or another, uh, clearly in the Old Testament through Abraham and, and uh, David and the patriarchs, his focus was on Israel right up through G Jesus' ministry. You know, Jesus primarily focused on Israel. But since, the, since Pentecost, since the coming of the Spirit, his focus has kind of shifted. And you kind of see the exclamation point put on that in AD 70 when the Romans destroyed the temple. And uh, so they could know they no longer had that icon to worship uh, in, in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. So now he's working with the Gentiles and has been for 2000 years. And you get the impression from this. Well, more than impression. If you read the rest of the Bible, you know that God knows everyone who will come to him. So there's a number, you know, and when that yeah. number is reached, the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, right? And then he, I believe, will shift his focus back primarily to Israel to deliver on the promises that he made to them. Yeah, yeah. So when he does that, Paul says all Israel will be saved. Does that mean every Jew that ever was will be saved? <laughs> Ah, this is where the theologians wrangle. And, and like I said in the beginning, this will test your Bible study skills. So uh, the queen of Bible study is context. 
So let's go to local context first. Paul says, in the same way there has also come to be in the present time a remnant. Yeah. That's not all. Yeah. Okay, according to God's gracious choice. So in local context, it's it's not all all. But Paul, you know, in the book context, we go to Romans 2, and Paul says, For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor circumcision that which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that which is of the heart by the Spirit, not by the letter. And so, um, you know, Paul at the beginning of the book explains this. So when he says all Israel, he's, I, I, my opinion, he's talking about the true Jew, the one whose heart has been circumcised. And then we can go to the biblical, you know, we started with local within that chapter. We went to the book context, but we have biblical context. You know, what does Jesus say when he's talking to the Pharisees? You make them twice as much the son of hell as yourself. Whoa, that's pretty strong language. Yeah. Verse 33, uh, how will you escape the sentence of hell? Now, it, it's not an outright condemnation or judgment. It's a question, but uh, it doesn't look good for the Pharisee. <laughs> All right? yeah. And then in John 8, you are of your father, the devil. Okay. And then Matthew 11, nevertheless, I say to you, it will be more tolerable to, for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. He's talking to his own countrymen. He's no, talking no. about Capernaum and Bethsaida uh, and Chorazin, you know. And the, the last one, uh, this is the scariest verse in the Bible to mm. me. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Now, as Gentiles in the in the new covenant, we automatically assume he's talking to us, and we should. That's a good <laughs> assumption. It's scary. We, we need to be sober about that. But when, Jew, when Jesus said that, it was to Jews. And so obviously, some Jews didn't make it. Yeah. And so there's a an example, uh, in, at least in my opinion, going through the scriptures and looking at context and answering that very difficult theological question. Yeah, so. that's good. There's two other uh, places that I thought of when you were going through there where Paul says, all are not Israel who are descended from Israel. So just because you have Jewish blood doesn't mean you're saved. And in another place, I think in Galatians, he says, uh, peace to the Israel of God, and, or in other words, yeah. true Israel, right? Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. that you nailed it. Yeah. Well, I had to do my homework on that <laughs> question because I, I knew, oh, this is like a hot potato <laughs> in theological realm. So, yeah. So, uh, how can they be enemies concerning the gospel and beloved concerning the elected or election. Yeah, I think the, the key to understanding this has to do with 
understanding that we are time bound creatures, you know. Mm. So at the present time, the Jews appeared to be enemies because of their rejection of the gospel. But if you see it from God's perspective, outside of time, not bound by time, he knows those who are his. And in that sense, they are they are uh, are our friends by virtue of the fact that God has chosen them and he will bring them to himself in time, you know, mm-hmm. in his time. <laughs> just... Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think that really messes us up as we're reading scripture that we don't, you know, we're looking at our own watch. Don't, don't look at your own watch. My watch is going crazy now because I look at it. <laughs> You're talking uh, about it. <laughs> <laughs> hey, <laughs> but uh, God's time is not our time, you know. So yeah. yeah, it's interesting. Verse 32, he says, for God has shut up all in disobedience. That's that's Paul's message throughout Romans. But then he says, so that he might show mercy to all. Is God going to mm-hmm. be merciful to all? Yeah, again, uh, we got to take that in a biblical context. And uh, you know what? Uh, 1 Peter 2, 9, uh, for Christ died for sins. The, uh, uh, help me out. The My, just for the unjust in order that he might bring us to God. Yeah. Uh, once for all. Mm-hmm. It's in that for Christ died for sins once for all. You can make a case God has already shown everyone mercy based on the cross. Mm. Yeah, that's good. Now, I... you, you have to receive that mercy, but he's shown it and he's been mercy merciful to all. I love to say that there, you know, God's love for us is never in question. Hmm. He proved it on the cross. Our love for him is suspect. Mm -hmm. So I like that answer. That's not what I expected you to say, but I like that answer. (laughs) Uh, In the end, we condemn ourselves by rejecting his mercy. That's really, that's good, good stuff. Yeah. All right. Let's go to verse 33. Yeah, this is really the the summation of this chapter. Oh, the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments, how unfathomable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his become his counselor or who has first given to him that he might be paid back to him again? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever and ever. Mm. So are we ever going to understand the plan of God? Well, just go back and listen to Chuck and I's wisdom as we walk you through. (laughs) No, go back and listen to what Mike said at the very beginning. (laughs) Two doofuses. (laughs) (laughs) I, I have the I have a saying, the more I learn, the less I know, you know, yeah. and it, God has really been hammering this home to me is you don't have me as figured out as you think you do. Right. Mm-hmm. And here we come through this very difficult chapter and we've done our best to try to understand it. But the bottom line is uh, my ways are not your ways. Your thoughts are not my thoughts. I, my ways are higher than your ways by a long shot. Right. So. And yeah. I think that's a very appropriate verse to put at the end of this chapter where there were so many <laughs> difficult questions. <laughs> yeah, I like to say, you know, when we read the Bible, compared to all that God could say, really the whole Bible is Google Gaga <laughs> compared to what he could say. Now, it's not complete but it is sufficient yeah and we would do well to speak goo goo gaga (laughs) as best we can because that's our relationship with him trying to understand him 
even though he's the un understandable God, he is a personal God and he really wants us to relate with him at yeah. our level, you know? Yeah. So, good stuff. So, the head and my brain hurts after that. <laughs> how about the heart? What, how does this make us feel? Uh, less confident, less <laughs> uh arrogant um yeah. <laughs> more you know willing to admit that i do not know you know yeah i was gonna say the same thing in humble yeah. it makes me feel like oh, okay i've been put in my place <laughs> and, and i'm glad to be there you know so uh how about the hands i think uh, it, it follows exactly from that that uh you, this thinking or the realization that you don't know what you think you know is going to shape your ministry. You know, mm -hmm. for me, it's loosened me, loosened my theology considerably. We, we as human beings have a tendency to want to package and formulize and reduce stuff to its, you know, most basic elements. But God here is just blowing us out of the water going, the whole is so much greater than the sum of its parts that you have no idea. So mm -hmm. it makes me a lot less dogmatic, I guess, is what you would, mm -hmm. you would say. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it makes me want to do what we have been doing, you know, admit our weakness, you know. Now, we, we might lose half of our subscribers. Like, <laughs> What? We'll be down to three. <laughs> yeah, I know. But, you know, uh, because you need to be confident in what you're saying. Well, I am confident, but I'm not. Uh, I, I'm confident in a few things. And, I, you know, I write those in blood. Uh, some things I write in ink, but most things I write in pencil so I can erase later, you know. <laughs> so um, it just makes me want to continue to admit weakness and that I don't know it all. I, oh, clue phone, it's for me. <laughs> so... All this right. Week we, we shift. Paul's going to shift. It's been a lot of theology. Uh, it's been a lot of in your head. In starting with chapter 12, he's going to say, okay, you know, let's bring it down. Rubber meets the road. This is based on what you do and do not know. This is what you can do, you know, and he's going to get real practical on us. So it's classic. This is the way Paul approached things, you know starts with the theology that's driving the train and then gets down to the brass tacks, right? All right. I'm looking forward to it. We might be together on the next one. True. So that will be cool. All right. We love you. God bless you. And until next time, keep following Jesus. Amen.